So what I, I, I wanted to uh, um, just talk about a little bit is this painting of mine, Phoenix Arise, and I finished this uh, after four years in 1997. It created in card form uh, this painting. And I uh, sent out uh, invitations uh, uh, with the painting on the cover, and uh, I dropped them. And when I dropped them, they created an astounding, uh, and I'll have to grab it over here, so mm -hmm. the image. They created a, as you can see, a holographic DNA, double helix, weave, or tantra. And here we'll see that from creation to creation, we start to see how the painting mirrored itself, like lover and beloved. And there was the possibility of birth, which is neither one or the other, but the union of both. And then I flipped over the top card, and there was the egg and the double helix. And I put it together, and I saw the weave of the Tantra. And it started to reveal that this is a DNA that can't be sold to pharmaceutical companies. And that it also tells us that we are an art form, a living art form that everywhere we see the double helix is actually the recapitulation of the one creation. We're not born into time, we're born into creation. And that's the mistake we've been making, and that's why when we turn it this way, we see the slit eyes, do you see, and the slit mouth of the ancient alien. Oh, wow. That might not be so alien, just much more ancient than we're used to thinking when we haven't noticed our roots for a very long time. And that's why... Uh, I thought that was the end of the story, but I kept playing with the cards and I showed an 11-year-old girl, a friend of mine's daughter, this and I said, it doesn't it look like an umbilical cord or a serpent? And she slid the card over and mind you, this painting is called Phoenix Arise. And in the story of the phoenix bird of immortality and rebirth, it returns after 500 years and builds a nest. And there's a nest in feathers. Wow. Personal authorship is out the window at this point. <laughs> and then, as we know in the story of the phoenix, once the nest is built, it erupts into flames. And I pulled out the cards, and the nest erupted into flames. I can't figure out how you would figure out how to figure this out. <laughs> and as I kept pulling out the cards, it didn't reveal just random flames, as we can see. It actually reveals a blossom. So we have, in the language of creation, of art, of geometry, of mathematics, of fractals, a story that's telling us the story of the phoenix in a stable form. This is not a moving form, this is absolutely stable. So in 10,000 years this will say the same thing. And what it's showing us is that we're going from a contracted or nesting to an expanded or blossoming stage of consciousness. And that when we think of the one, this capacity to hold on strongly to a sense of compression, of containment, and then finally the blossom opens. And why does the blossom open? Because it, each petal ultimately surrenders to the possibility of its own greater beauty. The blossom doesn't know it's a blossom. It just stops resisting the bud and opens from within. This is what this is telling us. And that's why wherever this painting is opened in this way, it will create infinite mandala infinite blossoms. So creation is blossoming. Like Pythagoras saying God geometrizes, this is what he meant. He never said all is number therefore start with abstraction. He meant all is number because all is entity, archetype. And when you start with the first principle, life, creation, you realize it geometrizes to create unique beauty and blossom, but every blossom is whole and holy because all are created from the one. And what I love about this story is it's also from an original painting, meaning a work of creation. So like can only be known by like. And so in the story and the language of creation, 
creation itself is saying, you know what? You're a garden and you're blossoming beautifully. So don't look at the unique differences in your geometries unless you do so appreciatively because like artists, Michelangelo and Van Gogh are not to be compared. They both want to inspire you to paint. They're not interested in your opinion, really. That usually keeps you from painting. So paint. That's the story here. <laughs> <laughs> So amazing! <laughs> wow! <laughs> oh my God! And that's the. Uh, <laughs> and you know, it's it's the. Uh, wow, Lee, that, that was a, crazy. Isn't that it? was amazing. And yeah. That's, and that's what it's all saying. It is this story of creation saying, "What are you woven in?" The language of creation. Mm -hmm. So your so-called arts, which you disregard, are actually the greatest insight into your true nature. Because there you surrender to the mystery of not knowing rather than the certainty of ideas you think you have to prove. And this is what the flow is getting at. It's a human question. And that's why I feel this story here is really getting at the great human question of, well, who are we then? And when I look around, I realize, well, we're in a library, we're in a cave, it's painted, and we left the cave and now we've returned but this time we return with the inherited library of this great question of what does it mean to be human then and when we understand that we're the living library we start to understand what this knowledge emerging of the quantum field of the dna is all about it's saying you wear the same dna as i wear it's the same suit meaning it's not i know more and you know less as much as maybe, if we ask the right questions, will trigger in each of us a different set of assumptions that lets us explore with an openness toward future generation, rather than a fear that there isn't enough even for us now. And this is why I'm very much an exponent of Renaissance, or rebirth, meaning that Renaissance comes from shared enthusiasm. It doesn't come from a new form or a new style. It's just we start to carry the sense that I like this story of being human better. And that's what this art really has been about, is the story that began on 9-11. I'll show you right here where it did begin. This is, mm -hmm. this is the language that it is written in. This is the watcher figure. You can see this emergence here. And I started when the towers came down on 9-11 with this rhythmic language, this language of entity. I didn't know where it was going, but I followed it like a musician, like a, like a dancer following the flow. And as I did, the first entity was the, that emerged was this entity of Kuan Yin, the uh, great mother goddess Kuan Yin. And she begins to tell us the story of our weave. She says, you see, all is composed of entity, like cells creating and sustaining the body. Everything is essential to the greater whole, and that all is whole and holy. Nothing is separate. And this then emerges in a domestic space. She says, the waters are returning home. Because what's the truth about where we live in our heart? It's saying that each of us lives in a unique center, a unique dream. But if we begin to honor this unique dream, we will transform the linoleum of our perception into the absolute multidimensional depths of our own greater implication. And when we do that, we will remember ultimately that we're trees. We have a tree in our spine, it supports us. But like rings in a tree, we've been growing greater and greater capacity. And that's what this story here, beginning on 9-11 when the towers came down, I went back to my hands and knees, really like a child, falling back into a state of humility I did not know. And I didn't have a conceit that I would paint everything in the room, but rather it was the feeling that I must explore and express why being human is something noble and something wondrous and not something to be destroyed and thrown away as though it's sinful and awful and dreadful. I see far too much that is magnificent and remarkable in what we call human. But now we've inherited the outcome of all these questions in the four directions around the world. 
And now we return to the center of the cross, which is each of us uniquely. When that happens, we will each become the center which is everywhere and the circumference which is nowhere, which was the old expression of what God was. But we'll realize that the vision, the beloved that is our heart, is the God I within us, saying, are you worthy to the depth of who and what you are? Or are you just looking in the mirror of self-reflection and afraid of what you're not? Self-reflection is empty because it's flat. When you understand the depth of things, you emerge into the center of your own creative union and you literally return home. And that's what art's for. That's what the creative has always been for. To remind us that we are imaginative and that we are as interesting as the questions, not only that we're willing to ask, but we'll need to take responsibility for. So let me take you on a little journey in here mm -hmm. and we'll walk. I want to just show uh. how, let's begin here. This, this I want to show because everything will take us on a journey that uh, in this hieroglyph human soul. And we begin here uh, in, in what will be seen as really there are, there's a journey like in the church, a circumnambulation. We actually walk around the entire area. And as in the church, as in the labyrinth, as in the sacred maze, everything in those traditions was about the truth that our bodies are ancient, they're holographic, and it isn't about being instructed, but actually trusting the sensual relationship, the pattern relationship, as we walk through these environments. And one was meant to contemplate within these environments, because within this greater pattern, these deeper and forming or mentoring energies of which we are composed, we could hear more clearly and understand more directly. And that's why everything in, in this uh, hieroglyph has been a creative question of what if and so we start here with this birth uh, in from the West this birth into the mystery and origin of time this is called matter mater mother the journey of woman and the journey of really like this sperm and ovum the journey into the dissolution into time and then the emergence through matter finally uh, of the body and then into mater, the mind, and finally we then are born each through a unique mother, meaning no longer a shared cosmology where we know our place, but we are born into a unique dream where we have to find our place. And Jung called this individuation, the process of learning to come to terms with how we are, who we are, uniquely. And Joseph Campbell talked about this in terms of the hero's journey, that it is not, I'm a hero and you're not, but essentially each of us are poised on this great adventure called life. We will encounter dragons of different origins depending on our environment, but they are dragons and they will transform us because the key is not to have control over something, but actually to learn how to navigate ourselves as a vehicle within the great ocean of consciousness and to not worry about being dissolved. And that's why a lot of the story, everything in this work is about holding this position of the chalice, the body as the outcome of the journey through the feminine, in the journey of the masculine, of alignment and discernment, coming together finally, do you see, and forming that which is both masculine and feminine, meaning that like the two qualities of mind, and this is very important because everything in this relationship, in this environment, is saying that it is about how the brain has fundamentally structured itself and why we had to layer so many of the questions of what does it mean to be human, a bit like an electron trying every probable position so that it creates the foundation for the atom, the spherical nature. And this is why we're born from the mystery into time and manifestation. And we will move then, you'll see if we move this direction, up toward ascension. I should, is that, do you have enough light on that? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and you can see ascension between the pillars of duality, of day and night. Because the question be, of being human is how do we bring together two qualities of consciousness? The quality of consciousness that allows us to move through time and circumstance and to hold that focus, and at the same time then to create the capacity to hold the greater radiance of our knowing or of our greater mind. 
in a sense, the pillars of our greater wisdom that open to our greater knowing. And so ascension, this journey into duality and time, has been to bring these two qualities together. And the deeper story in the hieroglyph is, it's saying we are returning home because we have, we have succeeded in this. It's not that everyone individually has, but like rings in a tree, the species has created the capacity now to hold this resonance. And that means it's a reservoir that we are all being offered entrance into. It's there. And it's a bit like saying, do you want to enter it? It's yours. You achieve this, not in this one body, but across the ages. You're an ancient sequoia. You're the outcome of something enormous. Don't think the bark is who and what you are. It's fascinating indeed. It's the skin that connects you to this culture, this time. But when you move inward, you realize you are all cultures and all times. That the four directions that went out now return and you stand as the outcome of these four directions. That's when it says, ascension, there is no further to go in the development of the individuated ego. We're done. So no longer about self-reflection. Now it's time to move into the depths of self, which means I trust the actor within me not to dissolve when I allow these greater energies to move upon me. And that's mm -hmm. why where you were sitting here, I'll unplug this light. Mm -hmm. We see the heron once again that visited, but it will become the reoccurring motif of the phoenix because the relationship of the phoenix is that to the ancient Egyptians, the heron was the phoenix. So in the home of phoenix arise, the phoenix returns to tell the story of your consciousness is in more than one world at a time and it is up to you to trust the nonverbal, that which arises in you and what we think of as, oh, I don't know, inspiration. And that's why everything in this story is saying, you are each the grail. You are each the phoenix. You are a holographic wholeness, a blossoming of creation. Nothing incomplete, nothing partial. And that's why now, with this emerging knowing, we're being asked to enter a, co uh, a universe of co-communion, or communion and co-creation, actually. And in that story, it is telling us, like good relationship, you're responsible for everything. You don't get away with anything. You're entering the true relationship, darling, which means, can you be worthy? Not what are you entitled to? And that's when we turn from being entitled and truly become artists of consciousness because no painting gets painted unless the painter paints it. No sculpture gets sculpted unless the sculptor sculpts it. And no human being evolves into anything magnificent unless they tend toward that ideal. Otherwise, if you sit on the corner waiting for it to happen, you will sit on the corner not only in this form, but in all sorts of forms until you get up on your own and you start to do something about it. So in that regard, let's do something about it. We move toward <laughs> Eve here on the pillar. And she will take us on a journey. Do you see her well enough? Does she mm -hmm. have Okay, good. So I love her. She's, she, uh, when she appeared, uh, a book of wow. mine called Adam Reborn and Eve Restored, a romance in two parts flowed out of me because her story is so beautiful. And notice she's the central pillar. She's the mother of generation. Mm. And above her is the chalice. And when one stands, you can see the chalice is above our heads. Like a flower, it's saying, nothing to figure out. It's to open this eye of wonder. You see, that eye is open when we're born. And it opens when we die. And that's why when you see an infant, you'll see this sort of faraway look, as if they're looking at everything and looking at nothing at the same time. And that's because this soft spot is still open. Notice how this soft spot mm. hardens, and it brings the focus into the eyes into this is this because it's not that. And if you think about the learning or the balancing of the form that can finally, the wheel, like the ring of Saturn, that can hold this world in these conditions, finally becomes strong enough, you see, to hold the awakening mm. of this greater chalice. But we're the foundation that holds the chalice. She says, you see, I'll show you the truth. Here we see how First of all, she says, my journey is to reveal. Do you see, the journey here 
is actually not just the movement through time, but that the movement through time reveals the eyes of vision, the wings of vision. And here we see, she says, the arc that becomes a reoccurring theme in this work. And the arc, she says, reminds us that we're an ancient family and that far from being unheroic and sinful, we are incredibly heroic and remarkably daring. Most consciousness says, thank you very much, but I'll keep the all-knowing aspect of my mind. But we, on the other hand, said, what if we dive into unique creation? For that, we're going to have to forget what we know. We're going to have to give up our connection and dive into that dark. And you know what? We did. We dove into the dark because we trusted that our creative communion would ultimately awaken within these dark worlds with an art form undreamt of by our other consciousness. And that's what we're bringing back. And that's why this has been a very great and remarkable journey and something to stop feeling bad about and to understand that being human is very difficult. It's very demanding because like all great art, all masterpieces are very hard work and the human being is an art form of remarkable, unbelievable, unbelievable majesty and importance. And that's why she says, you see this journey, you began in unity, you moved into duality, you have blossomed. Now you take the adventure, both male and female, to realize that no longer is the cross the gate of death, but my cross, she says, Eve's cross, is the gift of life. And she says, the reason wisdom is feminine is that my questions always ask, does this nourish the tree? My questions always have to do with life, not math, not concept, but life. And therefore my first question, do you love? Do you feel responsible to the tree? Because those who came before you had just as difficult a time, and they felt the sorrows of being human, just like you did. So they ask, do you honor us? And future generations look to you even now and say, do you honor us? Are you worthy of this cross? Or do you think God is elsewhere? And that cross is the death in life. Because she says, no, life is the great gift. And to be human is something beyond imagining. And when we understand this, the chalice does become the uterus, the Eucharist, that rises and falls with blood. Because she says, my knowledge is the knowledge of the womb. My knowledge in the womb says everything is necessary for life. Therefore, an eye cell and a toe cell are each essential. Mm -hmm. And when the lover and beloved, when the masculine and feminine within the self and between lover and beloved come together, the masculine and feminine blossom, the eye of the eternal opens. And she says, now I take you on this journey toward the grail, which we'll see on the distant wall as it mirrors this with actually, you can see the infant lighting up by the skylight, actually, on the bottom. But she says, I'm going to take you on a journey. And that grail is actually on the spines of the books of religion and tradition. So she says, for this, for you to wear this, you have to journey through all of this. Because you are the living weave of all of this. And it's your journey. You're not a mistake. You're essential to the question of of what does it mean to be human. And that's why she says, when you understand that all of my children are essential, then we start to honor the knowledge of the mother. And the knowledge of the mother is, I love, therefore I am. Uh, but the knowledge of the father is, I think, therefore I am. And we are born of the mother and father. So the question is, how do we reconcile that? And that's how we bring this in. And she says, well, let me show you a story. She says, you see, here we have God the mother mirroring God the father of Michelangelo. But she's coming up out of, in our depths, in the domestic space, flowing over the linoleum. And we see her with this ark. And she says, you see, I remind you as the great mother that from this oceanic self, from these great depths, you have woven an arc of consciousness that now allows you to both hold your unique personality, your unique sense of self, your unique persona, but also navigate your ancient depths and one will not dissolve the other. And I feel that that's sort of the healthy actor, you know, that I can play mm -hmm. any role and not be dissolved by the role and always understand or distinguish between the two. 
And that's why we're really being asked in a co-creative universe to understand that we are conscious actors rather than psychologically impaired victims. And so she says, yes, now that you understand these qualities of your depths, understand that you will now walk between the pillars of Eve and the African Eve, the first mother, into the chalice of the heart. And here, as we hold this position, and that's why, again, it's the body, this sense of the journey to the West, we see the mirror of unique identity and self-reflection. I think, therefore I am. And the journey to the North and to the East, we'll see the knowledge of Sophia and of the mother, of the ancients, who said, I love, therefore I am. And since I love, I must be worthy of the ancestors. And so that's where we are connected also to the stargaze through which we came. But the journey has been this great right angle of leaving this because our journey has been to blossom. And so we see here once again this position of the chalice and the self-holding here, the blossom. And the question is, well, what is the blossom? And it says, you see this arc, like the two qualities of the mind, the feminine and masculine have been seeking one another to finally stand erect like the corpus colossum, so that it's not one or the other, but like great dancers, this sense of one and the other. That's what this environment is reiterating constantly. It's not one location. You are all of this. When you perceive that, in your blossom, you will realize that you stand growing out of Sophia. And look at Sophia here. Do you see the belly of the infant of the child? Mm, Do you see this with the eyes? Yeah. So she's saying, oh. you see, I remind you that your wonder connects you to your ancient knowing, but I also remind you that the human species is as a child. It does not remember who it is. And therefore, no matter how dark it feels, you must forgive this species. Its energy is not evil. Its stories are dark. And the way we transform is to forgive the darkness of not knowing and begin telling stories of knowing. And that's what she says, yes, because my gift are the waters of infinite generation, meaning whatever you concentrate upon becomes your truth. So if you plant weeds, I grow weeds. If you plant flowers, I grow flowers. Be a wise gardener. Whatever you consider, living in these waters of infinite generation will become your truth. And that's why she says, through this journey of innocence and the knowledge of these living waters, finally the chalice of beauty connects us umbilically to the seed in the heart that blossoms, revealing the greater chalice of living wisdom. Her beauty reminds us as she awakens, and we see the, again the, the cobra, the force, the kundalini, the serpent. So force and beauty emerging, and in its mouth we see the, again the egg or the brain, the knowledge of the feminine and masculine, the mother and father, the knowledge of cycles and time, the knowledge of birth, origin, and creation. And when I was working on her, she said, you must remember you travel universes through wombs, not machines. If it takes 100 million years to get to the nearest star, you have it all wrong. And that's when she said, you're not born into time, you're born into creation. You're whole and holy, and you are billions of years old. And that's why the lunar crescent, we'll notice this lunar crescent. This is very important for, especially for women to perceive this sense of why the lunar crescent, why Mary on the lunar crescent, why Isis. It was saying that the feminine reminds us that we are ancient and the outcome of a great journey. So the mother reminds us of our purpose and the father, archetypally, of our structure, our laws, our principles. And that together then, they create the alchemical union. But she's showing us here uh, this story that goes into her mind. Oh, I love this. <laughs> 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 And uh, she and I love this story. She said, "You wow. thought I said higher and lower self. I said higher and lower shelf." Um, <laughs> if you realize that, you'd be a lot more relaxed about your 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 being. She says, "You're you're born of what? Me, matter, mater, mother. You are woven of clay, salt, and water. And if you touch your higher shelf, you touch the ratios and mathematics, the patterns that inform not only your pattern but all patterns." across all time. So what do we have here? The higher shelf is actually the pattern. What is pattern? Potter. What is potter? Father. 
What is the lower shelf? Mater, matter, mother. So, mother and father, the two qualities of oneness behind the outer face of beauty and manifestation. And if we notice the higher and lower are really just a shelf dividing two qualities and not anything higher or lower in the sense of it's up there and it's down there, except in a metaphoric sense. So this is where we see, he says, when you understand that it is the union, then you understand the cross is not the cross of death, but the quintessence, the gift of life, and this great living chalice we see is entered through the male and female, not as either or, but one within the other, arising, surrendering, each to each. And from this journey, then, we understand that, yes, we are all born into the mind of death, fearing termination because of the friction of time. But we come around and see the young girl here, looking into the face of death, unafraid. And that's our human condition, I feel. This be bound between love and fear, wonder and dread possibility and uh, despair. And these qualities really war within the human psyche. It's not as though uh, some don't feel it. It's really this is the conditioning of these waters, these living waters. But she says, out of this great question then, rising up over the spines of the books of religion, we'll see how that on every spine there's a unique beauty, like on every spine that we are. But we've reached a point where it's no one spine, no one tradition, but we can put our hand in the mouth of the serpent, the other on the eye, and you see how this chalice then, we become once again the living chalice, the outcome of all of this. It says, you know what, we're more interesting as a theater of shared exploration, and from this shared exploration, the mouth of the serpent, you can see the sense of eternity, opens and gives us a sense that we are anchored to this knowledge, but we are the living outcome. And we bring with us our twin. This is over Jung and Mudra and alchemy. And the twin is that which we must give birth to. It's not known in the world shared by others. It lives in us. It doesn't know what it is. We don't know what it is. And we are both that irritation within ourselves to finally be transformed in the process of bringing something forth. And that can be a poem, it can be a, a child, it can be... But anything where we actually are entering from, from leaving concept and entering creation. And that's, of course, where we must trust our own unique twin self. One looking into the world and one looking into the inner world. And from this union, then, we turn in this blossom. And she says, you see, the story is, as you can see with the ancients here, that we began with the ancients looking toward the stargates. And the story here is that we don't begin in not knowing, but rather with vast knowing. And we wanted to forget. We wanted to turn toward Gaia, toward Earth, to make her our first mother. And to do this, we would have to forget what we once knew. I say we once had very large heads, and we realized with all that knowing, we would never be able to convince ourselves that we didn't know. And a bit like cutting off one's head, we place certain qualities and hid them from ourselves so that in innocence Adam and Eve would come forth and forget where they were from. Because think about this in terms of developing unique creation and intimacy. When Adam and Eve don't remember who they are or where they're from, they have to look into each other's eyes and trust the universes of love that affirms the existence of each other. And that's when we start to grow universes of intimacy. When we no longer know our source and origin, but realize in each other we must trust our unique, intimate connection. And this is why over the centuries, over the millennia, we've been developing that which began first in the time of the mother. When we look at our ancient uh, times, we look at uh, New Grange in Ireland and all the mounds, the, that's all wombs, it's breasts, it's all about fecundation, all about fertility. All of our, our stories are about the ancestors. We have totem poles. Everything is about, do not forget where you are from. And that's why the mother then becomes this time, and it's reflected in our life as well, of learning to trust our physical form. Because we're going to take a journey toward blossoming that will reach this point here and turn toward the mirror, turn a corner. And this is where you see this Christ face. Mm -hmm with the elongated nose and the mustache. This is where we encounter the Christ, uh, this right angle. 
and the blind eye of Christ and the open eye. The blind eye, like the scrolls here, like the stern father is saying, you're a great dancer, and if you keep using your feet that way, you're never going to be a great dancer, but in you is a great dancer. So until you use your feet the correct way, I will seemingly torture you, and it will hurt, but you, at the end of the day, will perform in ways you cannot even conceive of. And this is, a lot of times, it's very hard for us to understand, because it seems very, that things are very difficult. But it really is this great insistence that you're far more than you think you are, and the reason the pressure is upon you is like a diamond. It's to remind you that you're far more than you think you are. Um, and that's why, though, this open eye is the knowledge of love, and the black eye or the dark eye is the knowledge of thought, and that this was the journey that we took, as we can see here, into unique creation toward the mirror of unique identity. And here, you see, we've, we've begun with the journey of birth, and here we have finally reached unique self-reflection, self-awareness, individuation. Mm -hmm. and this is very important for our journey as human beings because we've needed to reach this place. Do you see again once the chalice? So we become the living grail. We each realize that we are the outcome of this journey toward what we thought was God, but actually what was God is actually what we have projected outside of ourselves, thinking, no, no, that's not me. And that no, no, not me, has been the carrot that's led us deeper and deeper into the forest. <laughs> so when we finally reach here, and I feel this is the 2012, the winter solstice, we see here the seed and here the blossom. So we hold both the seed and the blossom. And we see here Alpha Omega. So you can see here when a person puts their left hand on the seed, the right hand on the blossom, they're holding the living chalice within which they're holding the truth that they are Alpha Omega. Their heart is Alpha Omega. And when we look up, we'll see Sophia, the knowledge of love that pulls us up. And to balance this, we see, we look down and here, we'll see the eye or vision. So between love and thought, the mother and father, we are born as seed and blossom. And that's what this is saying, again, that the love story here is that lover and beloved separated. And that vision said, darling, you will stay aloft and my yearning for you. I'll figure out how. I'll have to do it just with vision. I, I don't know how I'll do it. But my yearning across the ages will build on these membranes of time and space until we can create one of these bodies that then becomes the synaptic connection between these two qualities. And that's very important because it says you're essential. When a human being gets here, they go, ah, I'm part of the picture. I'm necessary. And that's why I say, as one stands here, the mantra is, I love, I think, I am Alpha, Omega, Seed, Blossom, Infant, Ancient, Female, Male. I am Alpha. Omega, C, Blossom. And this is taking back the multidimensional self. And we will realize that we've been trying to get into that room. And no matter how hard we push, and no matter how great we think we are, we can't get any further. And that's been the problem in the world. I've got more money than God, but I'm unhappy. Or I've got you know, this story of self-reflection isn't working. And that's going to free us to finally turn back away from self-reflection and the room in there back into this room where things are tangible and we realize that we are the living resource and the outcome of this journey. And that, like Dorothy, we only need to go as far as our home, our heart, and understand that our heart is our beloved. And our beloved says, darling, are you going to be true to me? I pulse as your blood. I am in every part of you. And all I ask is when you are afraid to breathe deeply. Every sailor in a storm is afraid, but it's really meant just to keep them conscious. Be conscious, but breathe, because it's an extraordinary adventure you're on. And you know what? You're an extraordinary navigator. 